<laughs> well, we're going to get fed very well, Lord willing. Hopefully some things will be said uh, that will cause you, again, to assess and reevaluate your relationship, your walk with God. Uh, and if you haven't started your walk or your journey uh, with the Lord, hopefully something, again, will be said today uh, that will cause you to move in that direction. Uh, because as we've experienced various tragedies over the course of these past two weeks, and just listening to things that are going on locally and internationally, um, these are very difficult times, challenging times for a lot of people. But at the same token, uh, these things were happening well before they happened even two weeks ago. Things have always been going on in certain parts of the world, certain parts of the state, of the country. We just haven't heard about it sometimes, but we're hearing about it now. Uh, and I would say, too, let's continue to keep roles in prayer who are experiencing some transitional times right now, some challenging uh, moments, especially for those in, uh, in Paris. And even for those here locally, too, uh, some tragic things have come about. But we still always ought to remember that God is in control. He's in control at all times. And he has complete dominion, rule, reign, kingship, lordship, whatever you want to call it. He is in charge, always. And even as we look upon some of these tragic events, it ought to cause us to grow closer and get closer to him and seek refuge in him even during these challenging times. And with that said, let's take a look at Exodus. We're going to do a little Old Testament fun um, this morning. Looking at Exodus chapter 16. And if you could, please repeat after me verse 15. So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, this is the bread. Which the Lord has given you to eat. Excellent. As we spend some time together and looking at this text, really covering some ideas from the entire 16th chapter of Exodus, I would ask if you would look at someone close to you and ask them, what is the mystery behind the manna? What is the mystery behind the manna? It's very important for us to realize and understand that God is also in the little things of life. And if we don't really look for God, even in those little trivial things, we oftentimes miss it. We uh, tend to be a society that likes to uh, feed upon exaggeration. We like to see things done in a melodramatic way. Um, some of you can recall your Jerry Springer days. I know I can recall mine. <laughs> Where it's almost a sense of enjoyment to watch and just see who's it going to be next. <laughs> and who's going to show out next. And which chair is going to fly. And what's Steve going to do after things go down. Because very interestingly enough, you know, historically speaking, even the Romans tend to have more of a melodramatic culture. They like things to be over the top. And it's very interesting, even in Western civilization now, we tend to like to look at things uh, that are bigger than life. Hence the things we see on Facebook at times, the things we see on YouTube, different things we're exposed to on television. And that's why my wife and I actually enjoy watching Matlock. I think I share that with you because it just keeps that drama just at a nice medium. <laughs> but these days, you see all kinds of things that make this really big, over-publicized and dramatized uh, deal. And again, if we're not careful, we sometimes can miss God just in the little things of life. But how sad is it for those who have been able to see, and I'm speaking of the Israelites specifically, those who have been able to see the greater wonders that God has performed for them. How sad is it to be able to see those things with your own eyes and still doubt or question whether God is concerned with you or not, or whether he's going to bless us at any point in time. I mean, you all recall as Moses is leading this exodus out of Egypt, they run into some trouble. And God allows Moses to put himself in a situation where he's able to part the Red Sea. I don't know about you, but if I saw something like that, I would just be dumbfounded. I would just be in awe to be able to see water just still on both sides of me. And even be able to see the fish or the sharks that could have gobbled me up right then and there. They're all just there. Everything's frozen. And I'm able to walk 
not on moist land, not on mud, on dirt, dry land, and be able to get from one end to the other, that would just mess up my mind. And how interesting, again, and how sad it is for those like the Israelites who saw this. And only within two months and 15 days of exiting out of Egypt. Now they're complaining because the water's bitter. And why, Lord, did you, why you put us out here like that? We don't have any food to eat. You know, we were doing better off. We were doing better off with our pots of meat. And we had things to drink. And we had bread and so forth when we were in Egypt. You got folks so caught up with a slave mentality. They really don't know how to get out, do they? You know, we oftentimes talk about it, especially in the African American community, how slavery still exists for some individuals. It's not physical like it was at this particular point in time in our history, but now it's mental slavery because some people still can't break free of the grip that has been held on them for some time. Some people who haven't even experienced, like myself, haven't experienced those types of historical events still call up with the mindset that, oh, it's this particular person. There's this subgroup of people are always trying to keep us down. But the reality is that God is in control. Yeah. And we need to lean and press into God so he can bless us and lead us in the direction that he wants us to go in. But here we have the Israelites complaining and griping, which helps us to understand that it is easy. It can be easy to forget all that God has done for us. It can be easy for us sometimes to forget how God has delivered us from certain situations. It can be easy for us to forget that God does have power and dominion over all things, even in the midst of craziness around us. Yeah. Even when we have people out there that will do things and will take their life just because it makes them feel better. Yeah. We forget what God does for us sometimes because we oftentimes get a bit too comfortable. How easy it is to forget what God does, but it's also very easy for some, if we're not careful, it's easy to remember how good it used, how good it used to be when we were caught in our sins. Come on, preacher. We sometimes like to think about that old man or that old woman and think about just, you know, how good those days were. Because when I was out at the club till four or five in the mornings to shut it down, I had a good old time. <laughs> Or when I was going from man to man to man to man, a woman to woman to woman, Charlie Sheen, anybody, when I was going there, how great it was. I didn't have to put a ring on it. I could just go. If we're not careful, we can forget how good God has been to us. And we can easily remember what it used to be like when we're caught up in our own filthiness. Interestingly enough, the Israelites quick to forget yeah. and real quick to remember just how good the meat was, how good we had all the bread. I mean, we were locked up, but hey, they fed us. <laughs> how could you put us out here like that, both? <laughs> and just as he always does, God delivers yeah. on time. Yeah. 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 And so we'll set the tone with this idea here. Again, coming from Exodus chapter 16, we see that even in the midst of the grumbling and complaining, God delivers. Yeah. And he sends them something very special. And I'm not talking, as Brother Bateman illustrated earlier, I'm not talking about snow when it comes to man. <laughs> and interesting, so my daughter, she was tasting snow yesterday when we went outside. And I don't know if she liked to taste it. I think she did, because she kept on, <laughs> kept on trying it out. I said, do it now while it's fresh, because uh, <laughs> too much time passes. I don't want you to put that in your mouth. <laughs> Well, we see how God blesses the Israelites. First of all, he sends quails along throughout the camp. He says, I'm going to feed you. I'm going to take care of you. But I'm going to let it rain down bread from heaven. Yes, sir. And there's a set of instructions that I want you to follow when I send my blessings to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But even with something as small as manna, and I've actually heard it said that manna is, is like frosted flakes. Uh, mm. Not necessarily. <laughs> That's the closest thing we can think of there, but when he sent this manna down, interesting enough, the people didn't even know what to call it. They would gather it up, and they would say, what is it? Which actually is what the word manna means mm -hmm. in the Hebrew sense. Yeah. And to pronounce the word manna in Hebrew is mon. If you can imagine the Israelites scooping up 
this man, I don't know what it is, and they're saying to each other, Mon, Mon, Mon? Not a Mon, Mon. They don't know what it is. All they know and can identify is that it came down from the sky, it came down from heaven. And I want you to be able to see here this morning during our time together that the mystery behind manna is actually Jesus. Mm -hmm. yeah. Through the manna that God was sending down from heaven, he was helping the Israelites, he was preparing them yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. for Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. We're going to look at three, again, core ideas <coughs> here, and then we will close out this lesson on this morning. First of all, <coughs> the mystery behind manna is that, actually, Manna tells us who Jesus is. You can look at someone next to you and tell them that. Manna tells us who Jesus is. Manna tells us who Jesus is. The bread that came down from heaven, and I would encourage you as well, when you get time to do your own study, really cross-reference Exodus and John chapter 6, because we hear Jesus speak often in John chapter 6 about, I am the bread from heaven, sent down by the Father. But we see who Jesus is in these little coriander seeds that come down to nourish the Israelites. First of all, we see Jesus in the sense of his humility. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, God didn't send a T-bone steak down every day for the people. He sent something small. He sent something small that was going to fulfill them. We think in the comparison to Jesus, when Jesus was born, he wasn't born at the Hilton. Well, come on, preacher, work your lesson. Or at the penthouse. Yeah. Jesus was born in a manger, yeah. which emphasizes this idea of humility or lowliness. Mm -hmm. When Jesus became an adult, fleshly, I'm speaking, as he became an adult and matured, he didn't take on kingship yeah. and be carried around by servants. He became a servant yes, for others. Yes, we see this bit and piece of Jesus' character in this manner, again, in the sense that this is not some well-laid-out three-course meal that's being supplied to the Israelites each and every single day. It's something small and simple with just a little bit of frost. Come on now. A little bit to hold you over. Come on some would say it tastes like honey, biblically speaking. He sends that to them. And he says, for 40 years, I'm going to have you take part in this. Sometimes we look for the bigger things again in life. Yeah. And it's almost interesting. I had a conversation with, with someone not too long ago. It's like, it's like people crave attention now. Yes. People want to be recognized for their awesome, mighty, whatever it is. Yeah. People want to be recognized for how smart they are. People yeah. want to be recognized for just how strong they are. People want to be recognized for just how powerful they think they are yeah. and how they can get what they need to get and deliver 10 times out of 10. They've forgotten the whole idea of humbleness, yeah. of lowliness. Yeah. God always used humble or lowly people. Yeah. Yeah. And even in their defects in life, yeah. God was still able to use them. For example, Noah battled with alcohol. God was still able to use him. Abraham was too old. God still used him. Yes, Gideon was afraid. Yeah. God still used him. Yeah. Moses had a speech problem, but God still yes. Samson was a womanizer. God still used him. Uh, Jeremiah and Timothy were too young, but God still used them. Jonathan ran from God. God still used them. Martha worried too much. Well, God still used her. Come on, preacher. The Samaritan woman was divorced, but God still used her. The disciples fell asleep while Jesus was praying. God still used them. Lazarus was dead, and God still used him. If you're ever wondering whether or not God can use you, that should not be a question to ever cross your mind again. God is looking for humility yes. in us. Yes. He's looking for the lowly person, mm -hmm. the one who puts God first, the one who puts others second, the one who puts himself dead last. Yes. As uh, some of my youth would say, you've got too many folks out here that are thirsty. I don't know if this is you. <laughs> the thirsty for attention. Yes, God can't use you when you're acting like that, when you're putting yourself out there. Yes. 
He sent them something as basic and as simple as man. Yeah. And God says, I want you to see Jesus here. I want you to see his humility. But he also says, I want you to see how sweet Jesus is. Again, just a hint of frost on the small coriander, white coriander seed. It tasted like honey. We all know, hopefully, that Jesus is sweet. We have tasted that the Lord is good. Do you remember when you had issues or when you had some challenges and you just didn't know how God was going to work it out? Remember when he worked it out? And then he blessed you even more on top of that. He gave you things you didn't even expect to have happen. And you thought back and reflected to yourself, how sweet was that? He's sweet to us. The manna shows us who Jesus really is and his humility and his sweetness. But even then, because some folk are greedy, some folks want to take something that's sweet and try to add to it. Yeah. They're trying to try and make it better. Yeah. Yeah. We see an example. Let's go with me real quick. Let's go to Numbers. I have to show you this. This is interesting. Even when God blesses us, sometimes we still mess it up. Isn't it a blessing that we don't see what God is going to be doing in our lives in the next three to five years? Because he's so sweet. And sometimes we can't take it. We still try to mess it up and make it worse. Go to Numbers chapter 11. Let's go to verses 4 through 8. Core example. Folks trying to mess up something that's already great. Now the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense craving. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up. There is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. We are not called, we are not here to add to what God has already given to us. We're not here to be greedy when God has blessed us with certain things. Sometimes we just want more. There's a danger going into next week because some of us got a budget. Some of you are supposed to have a budget. And what's going to get dangerous is when you get on line, when you go out in the street and see that, oh, that costs $3.99. I think I got, I think I got $3.99 in my pocket. I mean, I, my, my budget is for $200, but I got $3.99. And then while you're in the checkout line, you know, you see something else. That used to be, it was, it was $500, but now it's on sale for $150. You know, this is a steal. I can't, I can't let this down. You know, I, I just that would look so great next to my other 50-inch TV. I, I got to have that. That dual screen right there. I can watch football, I can watch movies on the other. Yeah. Mess around, end up broke. Because of greediness. Because God has said, I've already given you everything you need. And yet you still want more. Look at someone next to you and tell them, the manna tells us who Jesus is. Also, through the manna, we're able to see that Jesus is eternal. And I find this very interesting. The Bible describes the manna in verse 14, 15 of, of Exodus 16 there. Describes the manna as small and round. Now some would debate this is a stretch. But we have an understanding of things are round. Actually, it's symbolic of eternity. This finger here. This ring, I should say. It's on my finger. That represents eternity or timelessness, a bond between my wife and I. The thing with eternity is that you really don't know when it starts and you don't know when it stops. If you ever look at a circle, you can't measure that in the sense of where does the circle start, where does the circle end. He senses them these round pieces of manner to show who Jesus is. Come on, preacher. Implying the idea that Jesus is eternal. We don't know where Jesus began. It ain't for us to know. We don't even know where he ends. It ain't for us to know. All we know is that the idea of eternity, that's what we need to be planning for. 
Some of us are planning for the short term. I can't wait for retirement. And then what? We're called to plan for an eternity with our Father in heaven. And our brain can't even, we can't even wrap that idea around what that's like to be in eternity with God. But I'll tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. I know eternity's coming one way or the other. And if I had to pick and choose, and I don't think any of us in here would disagree, I'd rather spend my eternity with God than spend my eternity in hell. He sends these messages and signs just in the little things of life to project the bigger idea of who his son is and eventually understand that he's going to send them to the earth to work through and with mankind. Good teaching, God. Tell someone, the manna tells us who Jesus is. The manna tells us who Jesus is. Now tell them, the manna tells us how Jesus came. The manna tells us how Jesus came. The manna came from heaven. The word comes from heaven. The word put on flesh and became Jesus. And he came from heaven. When people look at us and work with us, they ought to be able to see some type of heaven somewhere within us, some type of heavenly function within us. Some people will see that in us. And some people will cling closer to us. Unfortunately, some will see that heaven persona in us, and because they're not ready to establish a relationship with God, they'll run away. Yeah. Amen. But the idea is that we all have some heavenly work within us. Yeah. How sad is it for one to see the devil in you mm-hmm. and cling tighter to you mm-hmm. because that person knows that you guys have the same agenda. Yeah. 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 Remember when you came to the Lord and some people had to be pruned or cut out of your life? Uh-huh. Because you know, you know, our friends knew who the go-to guy or girl was. Yeah. If I needed something to be stole quickly, I know who to call. If I know I need quick money, I know who to call. If I just need a quick fix, they know who to call. When people look at us, they ought to be able to see that which is heavenly. Christ within us. Christ came down. Yes. For us. The manna came from heaven. But interestingly enough, the manna also came to rebellious people. Mm-hmm. Preaching. Some of us act like God ain't going to come to them because of their rebelliousness. He's only going to come to those who stand up straight and know, can quote several verses of scripture, who dress nice, clean shaven. That's who the Lord wants. Because they say, cleanliness is next to godliness. I ain't got no Bible for that. But that's what Mama told me. God responded to his children as they're in the wilderness of sin to a rebellious bunch of folks. And even in the midst of loving them, and giving them everything they needed, they still rebelled. God says, look, I'm about to send this manna down and put these quails around here, but I'm doing that so that I may test them. (coughs) You've already seen my power, but i got to evidently show it to you again. And so when I show it to you, hopefully you understand that I am your God, and you will obey my instructions. How many times does God have to show us and prove to us that he's real? How many times does God have to keep bailing out of certain situations for you to be able to see that he does exist and that he is working within our lives? He ought not to have to do that. Look at verse 20, Exodus 16, verse 20. Jesus came to rebellious people. The manna came to rebellious people. Here's the example. Verse 20 says, Notwithstanding, they did not heed Moses, but some of them left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and stank. And the idea is that God said, look, I'm going to give you this manna. Take what you need, 
and I want it all gone by the morning. And everyone took what they needed. But some folks trying to scoot a little up under the rug. They're trying to hold on to it. And my daughter, she had some candy last week, and I, just, I thought it was just so funny. She loves chocolate. Amen. Please don't give her any. <laughs> no, she loves chocolate. And she had these Reese, uh, no, no, Hershey kisses in her hand. And I said, child, just put them in your pocket. They're going to be there. They're going to be there. They're not going anywhere. She wanted the security of knowing that these Hershey kisses are in my hand. As I'm working one right now in my mouth, I know I've got them right here in my hand. And then later, I noticed, I said, why you got chocolate on your hands? Why you got chocolate on the bag the Hershey kisses were in? Why is the chocolate on your coat and on your pants? God bless her. Girl held the chocolate so tight <laughs> that it got warm. And that warmth started to cause the chocolate to melt. And then she got chocolate all over the place. But I had to laugh at myself and I said, you know, I thought then, how often do we do stuff like that? Yeah. How often do we just hold on yeah. because we're afraid of losing out, of yeah. missing out on something? Yeah. We actually do someone or something more harm than good. Yeah. Some people hold on to others so tightly mm. that they restrict them. Yeah. I'm amazed sometimes when I see, especially young men, who are just trying to get away. Wow. They're trying to get out because they've been squeezed so tightly by a parent, mm -hmm. and, and it's actually done them more harm yeah. than it has good. Yeah. Because I've protected you so much, yeah. I'll never let you get in trouble. Yeah. My baby doesn't do any wrong. Uh, wow. I'm going to hold on tightly to you, and I'll always be here. <coughs> they don't hear about it another year when, uh, when they're trying to get away. Yeah. Like, it's time to go home. Well, I don't want to go home. But the idea here is that sometimes we hold on to things and try to, again, be greedy and try to scoop up so much mm -hmm. that we want to mess it up the whole plan that God has put in, in, in place for us from the beginning. Yeah. We mess it up. Yeah. Tell someone, God came to rebellious people. Look at verse 27. Let's get down there. I have to show you this as well. Another sign of rebellion. <clears throat> the Bible says, Now it happened that some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather, but they found none. Verse 28, and the Lord said to Moses, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? The idea here is that God said, when you, now on the sixth day, you're going to collect twice as much. <coughs> because you're going to need something to eat on the Sabbath day, because you're only going out there to work. Right. And yet you still have folks that don't follow directions. <laughs> it's amazing how we as adults are sometimes like the kids. Yes. We don't follow directions. He don't know what he's talking about. I, I'm going out there. If I can get enough for me and my family for extra, I'm going to get some. Yeah. Went out there and felt silly because there was nothing out there. Yeah. Just some rocks and dust. Yeah. But even in the midst of our rebelliousness, God still loves yeah. us. Yeah. Yeah. Even when we make mistakes, God still loves us. Yeah. Even when we knowingly yeah. Yeah. try to think we can cut a corner, and we fall on our face, God still yeah. loves us. Yeah. Tell someone he came from heaven. He came, from he came to rebellious people. Now tell them he came where the people were. Came where the people were. God didn't say, I'm going to bring manna down. And y'all going to have to hunt, walk a couple of miles to go get it. God always met people where they were. And he still continues to meet us where we are right now. Do we do the same if we're called to be a reflection of God? Or must they wait until they get on our level first? When you get your shoes from Stacey Adams, then yeah, maybe we can talk. <laughs> or when you get to this particular place in life, then you know maybe we can have a conversation. We just found some grand examples of how God worked with folks from a lowly background. Yes. But how arrogant of us as Christians yes. to shut people out yes. because we think, we think they're not worthy. All right. All right. All right. And if you really think about it, 
You think about where we were some years ago, some months ago, some weeks ago. And God still loved us and protected us. And he sent people on purpose to us to bring us closer to him. Don't you realize that we are called to be sent out? We are sent out to bring other people back into a relationship with God. How many people are we bringing back? Now, again, this isn't Christian salesmanship. This is just spiritual witnessing. How many people are we witnessing to about how grand and how great God has been in our lives? He came and he met the people where they were. Jesus, as well, met people where they were. And he said, follow me. If you were to do an assessment right now, see how many people are following you? How many people would that be? <coughs> and if they are following you, where are you going? <laughs> and if you're going somewhere in life, who's directing your path? Come on now, preacher. And if you don't know who really is directing your path, or if you're in the driver's seat, then it's about time for Jesus to take the will. Amen. Amen. But if you really think about that, and I will challenge you later to reflect on that. How many people are following you? Where are you going? Who's in charge of the journey? Tell someone, manna tells us who Jesus is. Manna tells us who Jesus is. Tell them, the manna tells us how Jesus came. Manna tells us how Jesus came. Now tell them, the manna tells us what to do with Jesus. The manna tells us what to do with Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. Sister Freeman says, what are we supposed to do with Jesus? I'm getting to that part. <laughs> God says again, I'm sending manna down. And I want you to get it in the morning. He says, you better get it early. Because when the sun comes up, it's going to melt away and, and, and destroy that which I put in front of you. He's basically telling us, even now, here's what you need to do when Jesus is in front of us. Come to Jesus early. Come to Jesus early. So you're not trying to scrap and kick your way into heaven when you're late. You ever seen folks late before? You ever been late? <laughs> when you knew the deadline, the deadline is such and such a date to turn in your money to get your ticket. And you knew that two weeks in advance. And what happened? You showed up at the 11th hour, beating on those doors, trying to make sure, are they in there? Is somebody in? Come on now. I know it's 7.05. I know y'all closed, but let me in. I got the money. And have the nerve, have the nerve to get an attitude when they tell you we're all out. Well, I don't understand how y'all can all be out. Y'all need to have more. Well, no, you be on time. He says, get out there, get, get out. the manna early. Amen. Because the sun will destroy it later. Yeah. It actually look, it helps us look into a bigger picture. Come to Jesus now. Yeah. Come early. Yeah. So you're not sitting on your deathbed trying to say that sinner's prayer that doesn't yeah. exist. Yeah. Don't so you don't find yourself on the day of judgment that none of us knows when it's coming. You don't find yourself just dumbfounded like, huh, I didn't know. I didn't think it was going to happen. Is it still time to repent? No, it's too late, baby. It's gone. <laughs> don't miss out on your opportunity <laughs> to seek out the bread of life yeah. for yourself yeah. and do it early. Yeah. He says, if you want to come to Jesus, Send this man down. You're going to have to get down to get it. In other words, sometimes we got to forget about just how great we think we are. we got to forget about how well we think other people out there know us and our reputation. Yeah. Sometimes you just got to get down. That's right. And give God glory. Amen. Give him praise. Yeah. And say thank you. Thank you. Because you brought me further than I never thought I'd been. Yes. Sometimes we got to get down because they told you six months ago you weren't going to be here. Yes. But the bread of life, the Lord, 
still got you here. When they picked up the manna, they weren't walking all hearty. And just walking around, and I need you to pick that up for me, and I'll be waiting. <laughs> You better get down. You better get down and pick it up. So I once better say to you, get down. Uh, you're going to lay down and get down. But you better do, you better do something. You better get stupid. You better get down sometimes. Forget about the career. Forget about the education. Forget about the money. Forget about the material things. Forget about who you think you're going to be in the next 10 years. Forget about all the other folks that you think around you and all around you and covering you. He says, forget about all of that. Thinking you all that. All of us on limited time. He says, get down. If you want this bread. Get down. Look at someone next to you and tell them, get down. The man that tells us, tells us what to do, how to respond mm -hmm. when Jesus is in front of us. He says, take the bread early. Get down. He says, also continue. And that's the tricky part for the Christian. Yes, Lord Jesus. That's the tricky part. Yeah. He says, continue yes, sir. to feed on him. Yeah. Yeah. If we're not careful, we feed on everything else. Come on, yes. Jack. We feed on the other things just to make us happy and then help us think that we're in a good place. Come on, could you help somebody? Some of us feed on food to make us feel like we're in a good place yeah. right now. Uh -huh. Some of us feed off of other people's emotions and we reach <clears throat> off of them to make us feel like we're in a good place. Sometimes we feed off of the career or the job to make Come us feel on, like we're in a good place. Some of us feed off of our own children, living our dreams through them to make us feel like we're in a good place because that's going to be the next. <coughs> oh, I forgot the football player now. <laughs> But well, that would be like me saying, that's going to be the next teacher. That's going to be the next. <laughs> My job is to get them in touch early yes, sir. with the one who created them. Yes, sir. I don't care what career you do. I don't care where you go with that. I need to make sure you have a relationship with God. And whatever your career, your job, your function is, as long as I know that you have your own faith, and God, that lets me know I've done my job. We can go and go home now. He says to them, again, continue to feed on the bread. Stop picking these weak substitutes to be your manna, to be your bread from above. Feed on God's word. You know when people are feeding Excuse me, you'll know when people are starving yes. uh -huh, because they're going to start acting out of character. Amen. Amen. Physically Amen. speaking, as we get ready to bring this to a close, Amen. you ever been around folks that are real thirsty, real hungry? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. They start doing some stuff, you know, it's not them. That ain't you. <laughs> they always complain, I'm hungry, when are we going to stop? When are we going to eat? I mean, they're just out of character because yeah. they just haven't eaten. Yeah. Even animals understand that idea, too. Mm -hmm. We're learn even during... Uh, the Roman uh, era, they would take certain animals and starve them almost to death. So the animals would act out of character when they least release them upon Christians yeah. for persecution. Wow. I mean, you got animals, they eating the bones because they hadn't been fed in weeks. We as human beings, when we're thirsty, we get a little delirious, we get confused. Spiritually, we act out of character when we ain't. Say things that you shouldn't say. Show sure gonna help somebody. You do today. things that you normally don't do. You're thinking things that, that you know you normally don't think about. You're subjecting yourself to others that you normally don't be around because you're not feeding yourself. Or you preaching today, Doc? He says, continue to feed on the bread of life, and as long as we're eating that spiritual food, we will be more than okay. Because mature Christians, we can eat spiritual food yes. and still be able to live, yes. even in the midst of the craziness and the chaos around us. Mm -hmm. Again, just because we hear about it now, don't mean it wasn't happening last year or the year before. And it's unfortunate, don't get me wrong. It's tragic. But it's been happening. And when we eat and take of the bread, those types of things don't shake us. You know, you got folks scared of going to malls now. 